You're listening to World Class from the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. We bring expertise on international affairs from Stanford's campus straight to you. I'm Michael McFall, host of World Class and director of the Freeman Spogli Institute. Some of you may be familiar with the New START Treaty, which was signed by President Barack Obama and former Russian President Dmitry Medvedev in 2010. New START caps the number of strategic missiles and heavy bombers that those countries can possess, and it is set to expire in February 2021. Other, in other words, just in a few months from now, uh, unless a, and a new agreement is signed in the coming months. Our guest today is Rose Gottemiller, who is the chief U.S. negotiator uh, in the Moscow and Geneva talks. Actually, there were negotiations all over the planet, as I remember, Rose, uh, where details of the treaties were hammered out. I think it's fair to say this is one of the most, if not the most important arms control agreement in the last two decades. So congratulations to Rose for being the chief negotiator for this treaty. She's also the former deputy secretary general of NATO and one of President Obama's top nuclear security experts. She is currently with us here at FSI as the Payne Distinguished Lecturer at the Center for International Security and Cooperation here at Stanford. Welcome to the podcast, Rose. Thank you very much, Mike. It's great to be here. So we're going to do a little history and then we're going to talk about the future. But let's go back to history. Uh, President Obama's trip to Moscow in July 2009 was a big moment in the New START treaty negotiations. Tell us a little bit how you remember that trip and what was its important in terms of getting the parameters set for eventually finishing the treaty? Well, you will recollect, Mike, that those two presidents, President Obama and then President Medvedev, met for the very first time in London in April. And at that very important meeting, which I think you participated in, if I'm not mistaken, uh, they uh, put out a joint statement that laid the basic negotiating parameters of New START. It was really important at the time that they put out very important messages like this treaty is going to be about strategic offensive forces, reducing strategic offensive forces and not about missile defense. That was a really clear instruction from the outset and very, very important. But in the ensuing months between April and July, to be honest with you, we weren't sure if the Russians continued to be on exactly the same page that the two presidents had agreed in April in London. So it was really important to nail them down with this document that became a joint understanding between President Obama and President Medvedev and was signed by them in in July at that summit meeting. And uh, very importantly, it laid out some basic parameters, some ranges for what became the final and and succinct limitations of the treaty on warheads and delivery vehicles, that is missiles and bombers and and, uh, so forth. So it was a really important uh, document from that perspective. And I think really did help uh, to ensure that we were on the right we were on the same page and the right page as far as we were concerned in, in going forward then and, and completing the negotiations. So it really cleared up a lot of things for us. And I do want to comment that it was so important to have the president involved from the outset. When negotiators had that kind of clear instruction from the very highest levels of government, it really is a, a great tool to ensure that the negotiations move quickly and furthermore, that you can, you can hold your counterpart to account. You can say, hey, listen, don't mess with this. Uh, your president said this is what has, has to happen. So uh, it, was, it was a good moment in the negotiations for that reason. Well, I remember that um, there was some uh, pressure, time pressure, because the old START treaty, of course, expired in December 2009. How did that play out in the negotiations, that time pressure? Was that good or bad? Did that create leverage for... Uh, Ambassador Antonov, he was your counterpart, or did that create leverage for us? And and tell us a little bit about the time pressure uh, that you might have felt trying to get a new START treaty done before the old one expired. That's a really good question. I think, frankly, the leverage, uh, the leverage was on both sides and it differed from time to time. It was really interesting to watch. The Russians, of course, are master the diplomats and negotiators. They, they well know how to use leverage, but for most of those months from July until December when START was going out of force, I think both sides felt really driven under, under the time pressure. But as we approached December, 
that's when the Russians started playing around and saying, you know, oh, well, you don't want the treaty as much as we do, et cetera, et cetera, and trying to do a kind of tactical leverage process, which was really important. Maybe it was important at the time, but in the end of the day, didn't, didn't really mean very much. I really think once again that we were helped in those uh, autumn months by the fact that we got Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mike Mullen, involved uh, in the negotiations. He was willing to come to Geneva, first yes. of all to Geneva, to meet with his counterpart, the Chief of the Russian General Staff, General Makarov. And what happened after July was we, we did have you know, new instructions to push us along. But again, we weren't sure how invested the Russian military was in the negotiations because they weren't getting the instructions they needed out of the Ministry of Defense uh, in Moscow. Maybe the guys, the military guys on the delegation in Geneva, with all the best of will, were trying to get things done, but they weren't getting instructions. So we really needed to invest also the top level military leadership in, in Russia with a willingness to, to be involved and engaged and to push the military bureaucracy in, in Moscow. So that was really a, a very good thing that, that Mike Mullen was willing to invest his own authority in these negotiations and come to Geneva. I know you came on that trip as well. I, I remember it very, very well. Uh, you and Gary Seymour, both from the White House, were there, and, and that I think was really good because we we showed a lot of firepower at that moment. We showed again that the entire administration of President Obama was was really really committed to the negotiations. But Mullen, um, I think, used that first meeting in Geneva. We we wanted to to have some tactical progress. You probably remember we wanted to get agreement on the central limits of the treaty and some other important details. But Makarov just wanted to lecture us about missile defense. And that issue did keep coming up again and again during the negotiations. He just had an expansive speech he wanted to make. And so Mike Mullen was not getting the kind of you know, quick solutions he wanted on some of these problems. But I think he used the meeting well as a, as a really solid getting to know you session with Makarov. And at the end of the day, it was uh, their commitment to each other to meet again in Moscow uh, after the new year began that I think was, was important that they both said, all right, we're both going to be invested now. We're both going to try to make this happen. Now, they didn't agree on that Geneva occasion to meet in Moscow, but they did agree to go back to capitals and, and work these issues. And uh, that was when I began to see progress from the Russians, where Antonov, my counterpart, really a good negotiator, very experienced, but he was having trouble. He just told me, I, I don't have any instructions. And finally, he started to get instructions really quickly in those last weeks of November and first weeks of December of 2009. In the end of the day, it wasn't enough. Uh, it, there was another big blow up uh, in Moscow that I think was caused by, at that time, the Russian prime minister, and his name was Vladimir Putin. But that <laughs> put a wrench in the works in early December. Well, let's talk, let's talk about that. I mean, uh, I, I, the next iteration that I have in my notes is, uh, I, and I remember it well as, uh, again, in Copenhagen, uh, when there was a day-long set of negotiations, and you were there with the president. Uh, president Medvedev was there. Mr. Antonov, Ambassador Antonov was there. Uh, tell us about the importance of that meeting, but I also want you to dig into your, your interpretation, to the best that you can, of the bureaucratic politics back in Moscow particularly with Prime Minister Putin, who was not directly involved in the negotiations. Right. Uh, and then leading up to the meeting uh, in January that, again, Admiral Mullen flew with a giant delegation, again, uh, with you uh, and our colleagues to meet with Admiral, uh, General Makarov. Tell us a little bit about what you thought was going on in those December, January months on the negotiations in Moscow. The negotiations among themselves, not necessarily with us. I will always remember Copenhagen for a couple of things. First of all, a sea of mud. You know, President Obama was there to attend the, the climate conference that the Danes right. were hosting. And the Danes had just opened up a brand new convention center and it was surrounded by a sea of mud. It hadn't had its shakedown crews. It was trouble finding meeting rooms for the president. I don't know if you remember, but we met in a, in a dress shop yes, in, the the the, in the yes. basement. Yes. And, but, you know, to give the Danes credit and also our own embassy in Copenhagen, they did a great job creating a dignified meeting space. But it was, first of all, 
a sea of mud and a lot of a lot of things going on on the climate side that had the president, our president, very, very concerned and, and involved, as well as Secretary Clinton, who was along my boss, the Secretary right. of State at the time. So, so the Sea of Mud was the first thing I remember from that, that meeting. But the second thing I remember is my first meeting with President Obama. I don't know if you remember that or not. I wasn't yeah, expecting... I I wasn't expecting him to arrive just like that into yes. the meeting room, but he came into the meeting room and you were kind enough. You came over and said, oh, Rose, would you like to meet the president? So I go over and to this day, Mike, I think I was probably too much the fangirl for President Obama. I kind of seized his hand and shook it and said, thank you, thank you, Mr. President, for your support. And I could see, you know, he's a very, very obviously dignified uh, lawyer. And I'm not sure he was ready for a fangirl on that occasion, but it well, was a I thrill. I remember the fangirl part. Uh, I do <laughs> remember, and as of course you remember, because you, uh, throughout this process, uh, I was uh, always surprised at how uh, serious uh, President Obama took the New START Treaty. It was a very top high priority for him uh, throughout the entire process. And, and, and it was a thrill that he, he met you at that meeting. I mean, we had a very big delegation there, if you recall, because we had the climate team and the, the, the START team. Uh, and he gave it a lot of attention, a lot of priority. So, um, but I want to fast forward to then the meeting uh, again uh, in Moscow with the general and admiral and tell us a little bit about what you think the dynamics were going on between the Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, President Medvedev and Prime Minister Putin. I really uh, first woke up to this uh, in December uh, when I got back from the negotiations. We were taking some time off over Christmas to prepare the next round and we're back. And it was clear from some press appearances that Putin made that he did not like the treaty one bit and was beginning to attack it publicly at that time. And I thought, oh, here we go. Uh, we are you know, coming to the end of this game. Right. Uh, I really was convinced he was going to shut it down. And, but that was a time during which there was pushback and it was never explicit where the pushback was coming from. But I do believe that that was one time when President Medvedev stood up to President, I'm sorry, now President, but then Prime Minister Putin, Putin and yeah. said, we are going to continue this negotiation because we did continue the negotiation and in fact, very quickly got agreement from the Russians for Mullen and Makarov to meet again in Moscow and to try to work on some of the tough issues that were, uh, that were still out there. And so, uh, in fact, we did meet in uh, the end of January and uh, I think we agreed finally the, the final central limits of the treaty. We agreed some right. other important aspects, very technical details, but uh, something called unique identifiers on each uh, missile that help us very much during the verification process of the treaty to, uh, to monitor the, the various missiles and, and submarines, warheads, not the warheads per se, but, uh, but uh, their, their uh, launch uh, delivery vehicles. So it was, um, I think, a very, uh, very, very important meeting and, and one that uh, proved once again that the entire uh, U.S. government was committed because there was a huge delegation there from across the interagency, from the White House uh, on down, and uh, very interesting that we were actually negotiating on the fly with you know people calling back to their agencies yes. from from the Ministry of Defense of the Russian Federation. I know that there was no doubt a lot of people listening to those calls, but nevertheless, it was it was a, a fast moving negotiation, and we got a lot accomplished uh, that ended up being. Uh, core uh, to the to the treaty as uh, as it proceeded. So there was one more hiccup, as I remember, and, I, and it's in my notes as well. It seemed like the Russians, as you already have mentioned, wanted to get some linkages to missile defense constraints into the treaty. Um, tell us about that and um, how you eventually prevailed to not uh, to get them to say yes, despite those efforts. I have to say in this case, uh, it was a classic, uh, I would say negotiation in that uh, we wanted something on uh, telemetry. Now telemetry is flight test data that is, uh, is um, emanating from, from missiles when they are flight tested. And it's how 
each side uh, can tell its missile is, is behaving properly during the flight test. Well, in uh, the START Treaty, the original START Treaty, it was important that we exchange this telemetry data, this flight test data, Great. in order to determine the loadings of uh, uh, warheads, the accountable warheads on missiles. This is a, an approach that we did not take uh, in New START. In fact, we count warheads and confirm the presence of warheads directly on the missiles. So it's a different approach. Uh, so we didn't need telemetry in quite the same way, but it was important for our uh, process on Capitol Hill. We've been hearing clearly from senators like Senator Feinstein, Senator right. Kyle, that this was going to be very important to ratification. So we said to the Russians, let us put together a telemetry package that will be an important confidence builder in the treaty. And what was interesting was that President Obama became fully engaged in this discussion with President Medvedev and both men being lawyers, uh, they really dove in on it. And I was surprised that they, uh, they took such a detailed interest in it, speaking about it in several telephone calls and discussing it in various meetings. Right. But then the Russians, again, being good negotiators, they knew what we needed. So they said what they needed. They needed uh, some language on missile defense uh, in the treaty. And so this was a big fight back and forth because this treaty from the very outset, from the London meeting, was about reducing strategic offensive arms. It was not about putting any limits on missile defense. That's right. So we did agree some language eventually uh, that was a factual statement saying that there is a, an interrelationship between missiles, uh, offensive missiles and missile defense, which is a statement of fact. It also, we took care that it went into the preamble which is not legally binding language. It surely nice. just by that fact means that we are not placing any limits on missile defenses. But then we also had to work out some other ways to, uh, to satisfy the Russian concerns. And we ended up exchanging at the end of the day, uh, statements about um, missile defense, stating US position, stating Russian position. This is quite a typical tactic that's used to handle these kinds of uh, political differences in treaties. And I, I think in the end of the day, it, it, worked, it worked well. But uh, it was a tough fight and a long discussion. And once again, the presidents themselves were very much involved in it. Well, let's talk about the end game. Um, well, for, actually, before we get to the end game and the signing in Prague, there's, uh, there's actually two negotiations, right? There's the signing of the treaty and then ratification. Um, tell us first, you know, I don't know, best day, worst day negotiating there in Geneva. To get it, give us a feel for what it is like to negotiate uh, with the Russian delegation. You've said it several times now, they're good negotiators. Uh, I've met Mr. Antonov several times. I used to work with him when I was in Moscow. He seems like he's a tough, serious, sophisticated negotiator. Uh, I say that as a compliment, but I think it would be difficult to negotiate with him. When did you feel like things were going off the rails and when did you know that you had a treaty in hand? Well, the first occasion, of course, there were several very difficult days, but where I really felt we were so close to getting at least the treaty done in December of 2009. And Anatoly mentioned, I have some flexibility. That's after the first mullen makarov meeting in Geneva. The right. Russians were beginning to make progress, getting their instructions. They were coming up with some practical approaches, really good fixes for the problems that were still left in the treaty. I thought, great. And on that occasion, I heard from Anatoly that I should have new instructions by Saturday uh, to finish these key parts of the treaty. We should be able to get the treaty text finished. So I was delighted and really felt that they had come a long way. But on that Saturday, he called me up. He said, well, I don't want to talk to you in a quiet, small meeting, just the heads of delegation. I want to talk to you in a big plenary session with both delegations on both sides of the table. Uh -oh. And I thought, uh-oh, because that usually <laughs> means that this is going to be a very formalistic exchange. It's right. not talking turkey. It's right. a very formalistic exchange. And indeed, at that meeting, they took back every single new idea and new solution that they had offered up in the preceding uh, uh, week. Wow. And so that's when I said, something else is happening in Moscow. And now in hindsight, looking back because of the way Putin began to come into the press in December, right. criticizing the negotiations, I believe that it was actually Putin who probably came into that National Security Council meeting in, in Moscow and said, no, we're not gonna do this. 
because no, no. it just completely reversed the progress we had made. So I think that's probably what the worst day uh, in the negotiations. And it's of course- It's so interesting to hear you tell that story though, because subsequently we have more instances where there were pretty big disagreements between Medvedev and Putin about foreign policy issues on Iran sanctions. That came up later and most certainly it came up with respect to Libya. But yes. back in the period you're talking about, we really didn't know much about that, right? That I think no. it may have been the first instance. So, yeah. well, but you get it done. Uh, the presidents meet in Prague and sign the treaty. That, that was a great day in my life. That was the best day of the negotiations. You asked what the best day was. That was the best day. That was a truly uh, uh, amazing event. Um, but then there's the task of the next negotiation, which is with the U.S. Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about that process. Were you involved or was that other people in the, in the government? And this is a good time, I think, to remind our listeners why you yourself thought this was a good treaty that was in America's national interest. So tell us about both of those things. Certainly, the main thing uh, about uh, the work with the Senate was that it had to start early and it had to be consistent and persistent throughout the negotiations. We had a, a visit from uh, the National Security Working Group of the Senate, a kind of Senate observers group that came out to Geneva in November. We hosted uh, Senator Feinstein and Senator Kyle and their staffs, briefed them about the negotiations, talked them through what we were trying to accomplish. And that very day of the signing ceremony, we came out and did a, a detailed and very intensive press conference to lay out the main issues uh, in right. the treaty, the main differences between START and New START, talking about how we were taking an innovative approach to, to counting warheads in the treaty that was an improvement over how START uh, had, right. had uh, done it. And so from the very, very beginning, we were messaging back. But after that, the work on Capitol Hill was intensive because we had uh, over a thousand questions for the record from a senators. Thousand? over a thousand. Oh my goodness. They were very concerned and interested and they wanted to know, but that's my point, Mike. If senators really are uh, freed up to, to vote their own conscience, they will take a matter really seriously and they took New START really seriously. So we had to have 67 votes. That included, uh, that included a number of Republicans. In the end of the day, we had 72 votes. So we were able to work also well on the Republican side of the aisle with some very serious people who wanted to know why the New START Treaty is in US national security interest. My bottom line message is that it provides us clarity and predictability about what is going on in the Russian strategic nuclear forces. Right. These are weapons of mass destruction that could incinerate us in seconds. And so it's extraordinarily important that we keep a handle on them, that we know where they are, what they're doing, what their readiness status is. And the New START Treaty is, is constructed in its verification and monitoring regime to do just that, to let us know on a 24 seven basis what's happening with the Russian strategic nuclear forces. And that kind of predictability, I think we need into the future too, because we're all concerned about some of these new weapons that, that President Putin has announced. And we need to ensure that these new weapons can be constrained so that we are not facing uncertainty about Russian nuclear numbers in the future. And right. the Russians have already announced that they are willing to bring three of the four new systems under the New START Treaty if it's extended. That includes a new heavy intercontinental ballistic missile, ICBM, their new hypersonic glide system, and also their air-launched ballistic missile. All of these three. So those are all new delivery systems that they've already signaled they'll bring into this treaty. They'll bring into the treaty, and that keeps the numbers limited. It right. means that they cannot, they, because if they have only 700 delivery vehicles allowed to them, they're gonna have to get rid of some other stuff if the they bring these right. new missiles into the treaty. And that's, that's very important. It keeps them limited, and it keeps what they're doing with their nuclear forces predictable for us. Well, those are very, uh, so cut out the last part, Alice. Those are very convincing arguments to me. I hope they're convincing to President Trump. And of course, it takes two to tango. Both uh, governments have to decide to extend the New START Treaty. What do you think the prospects are for extension of the treaty? It's very interesting, despite Putin's criticism while he was prime minister during the negotiation of the treaty, 
after the treaty was in force and then in implementation for a couple of years, he declared it to be a gold standard for treaties of its kind and uh, one that the Russian Federation was fully supporting. So that was actually a relief that he came around to seeing it as very beneficial uh, for their national security. Uh, it has to be equally beneficial for both sides or neither side would sign up to the treaty. That's the reciprocity thing. But uh, in the ensuing years, they put some conditions on extension of New START, but now the Russian side has dropped all those conditions. So they clearly seem ready to go ahead and extend the New START treaty. I wanna just say, I give the Trump administration the credit for levering them into a corner so that they dropped all that conditionality they had on extending New START. That was smart and negotiations. It, that was smart negotiations. And, uh, and I think it was important to do so, but now it comes, around to uh, whether the Trump administration can agree to extend the treaty. And I see clear hints, you know, President Trump and President Putin have spoken repeatedly on the phone recently and many right. recent public statements, the president has said that he wants a new nuclear deal done. So I think the easiest way to do that is to extend New START and then to uh, build out further reductions uh, on the, you know, using the New START implementing regimen, the, the verification regime and so forth to, to right. implement those new reductions. So we'll see what they come up with, but I do believe that there's a bigger chance now that there will be some extension of New START, perhaps a shorter extension than five years, which is allowed under the treaty. But I do think that there'll be, uh, th there will be some extension of New START. Uh, I'll predict that for your listeners. Well, on that optimistic note, I do know, I, I think uh, President Trump has mentioned that he might be meeting with Putin in September. So maybe that creates the uh, opportunity to do that. But uh, oftentimes on World Class, we don't get to end on optimistic notes because we're talking about all the troubles in the world. Uh, thank you, Rose, for allowing us to end on an optimistic note. Uh, and congratulations on negotiating this treaty. Uh, you know, when I teach in, at, here at Stanford, my students about work in the government, I always remind them that it's hard to do anything in the government uh, it's especially hard when you have to negotiate with another country like Russia. Uh, and so to have completed such a monumental treaty, uh, I just say congratulations. Uh, and we look forward to reading the book that I know you're working on to go into deeper detail. And we'll have you back on World Class to talk about the book when it's done. That sounds great, Mike. I, I really appreciate it. And, and thanks for your support. It was a whole of government effort. We couldn't have done it without the White House, too. It's fun to be on your team. Thanks again. You've been listening to World Class from the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. If you like what you're hearing, please review us on Apple Podcasts. We'd love to know your thoughts. And be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, or wherever you're listening to stay up to date on what's happening in the world and why.